Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. Welcome everybody to another episode of Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment. My name is Ali Rizvi, and with me is uh, the great Armin Navabi. Armin, welcome. I mean, welcome. Well, hello. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you well, for having me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Okay, we've got Susanna here. We've got Mars. Yeah. Hold on, let me mute this. Okay, and then, yeah, sorry about that brief echo. So, yeah, everybody, uh, this is a... A topic that's really interesting right now. What's happening? Um, it's Done. unfortunately you've been following the the news in the U.S. and all the stuff that's going on over there. You know, you're not really reading about this a whole lot. Uh, but recently, um, uh, Emmanuel Macron of France, the president of France, he had uh, a he delivered a speech where he was talking about separatism in France's Muslim community. So he's worrying about the quote ghettoization of uh, the Muslim community in France. France has approximately like. Nine percent uh, of Muslim population uh, there, and um, he called Islam "quote a religion that is in crisis all over the world." Um, end quote. And we're going to get into the speech, the context of it, um, the backlash to it. Actually, he got a sp especially strong backlash from uh, Turkey's uh, um, uh, the, the leader of Turkey is uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, uh, and. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll talk about it because there's a little bit more that's been going on between these two leaders. Um, so yeah, we're going to get into that this episode and we get into the details of it. But uh, first, just before we do that, I wanted to have, we have a quick housekeeping announcement here that Armin Navabi, Armin Navabi and our secular jihadist Twitter account have both been suspended. So Twitter has suspended um, both of us. It's... Uh, Obviously, it's frustrating, but Armin, I don't know. Do you want to say anything about it? Um, Jai Shiram? I don't know. No, I <laughs> so that gives you a clue to why it happened. I mean, they're basically, uh, th this is another problem with the algorithms uh, for, you know, Twitter and, and uh, Facebook and YouTube as well is that you have these people who mass report. I mean, they have organized... Uh, scripts. They've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who mass report things, and and they and then these platforms take it down, and the appeal process takes ages, and this has happened over and over again. So um, it is something that uh, we have to fix. But this is just we're going to get back to the topic right now, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a future episode. But if there is anybody out there, if anybody over here is listening, uh, who knows anyone who works at Twitter or who works at Facebook, uh, who can um, help us out for a situation like this, because we anticipate. Especially with Armin's new, the last me should have uh, that we're taking on, um, uh, would be fantastic if we could actually have uh, develop some contacts. All right, let's get to let's get to the Islam being in crisis and all. Right, so Armin, this is a speech that uh, was done. Let's see, when was this? This is actually very recent. It's this month, just a very recent. Ago. Yes. Yeah. No, no, so just like less, not, not even a week. Not even a week, yeah. So last week, so, you know, France has a very, very strong uh, tradition of secularism. They had in 1905, they have this this, this act in, the, in their uh, constitution. They have a, they have a law um, that is that really firmly establishes. Wait, wait, before, before you go to the history, let's just like not bury the lead. Like this is the reason why this was extraordinary is because you have um, it's one of the leaders that is symbol of not, you know, whether both neither far left or crazy right leaning centrist, uh, you yeah. know, yeah, you got like one of the one of the symbols of sane left or sane liberal. liberal. The one of the main symbols of that all of a sudden coming out of like, yeah, we need to cut up. We need, we need to talk about Islam. <laughs> all right. So yeah. the great <laughs> the great thing about that is that. 
what we've seen so far for for a long time is that again i know that the policies and and the ground is different but when it comes to symbolism it seems like you had right leaning maybe eastern european uh leaders or you had far right leaders from india and then you have the whole china anti muslim you know you had the crazy far right anti muslim bigotry kind of narrative or people who are just anti immigration as a whole um or stuff like that and then you had the so called liberal world coming in and saying no like islam is great and yeah you know you know everything is fine this anything about is anything against islam is bigotry and we didn't have like really anything I mean, we did have some good policies, for, especially from France, um, but we didn't have any form of any form of a leader that a lot of people look up to. And I know a lot of people are also against them, but there's also people who look up to as an alternative to like Trump or you know other leaders. They Marilla say like, Pen. oh, this is like Marie Le Pen. Yeah, exactly. They say like this is a sane. This is like this is how civilized. This is how the civilized world works. This is how. The leadership that we could look up to that is civil, that is responsible, that is nuanced conversations, uh, t- telling people exactly what the problem is. So people look up to that as, especially in the world today where everything seems to have gone to crap. Again, I can't say SHIT because we're trying to keep monetized. Uh, but it seems like people uh, keep remembering Obama, like, oh my God, how great things, how people, civil and nuanced and more... The conversations were a lot better during Obama or stuff, stuff like that. And people look look up to people like Macron as leaders of what things, how great things could be. Again, I'm not yeah. saying whether they're right or wrong because I know a lot of people don't like the yellow jackets and all that stuff. I know, okay? But now we have somebody that represents all of that, that people in this world, that the leaders seem to go crazy. People look up to uh, Macron as a symbol like, guys, look, please give us some liberal sanity, okay? Um and this guy is coming out and openly saying, yeah, Islam is tearing us apart. <laughs> like, like we have a crisis with Islam and not just in France, but on a global scale. So this like really helps normalize discussing the problem of Islam on f- not just among activists, but it actually opens the door for a whole bunch of other leaders to be like, you know, talking about Islam in this way, that's not a just a, it's not a Trump thing. You know, it's not like a um, um, Hungary thing or it's not oh, like it's a, not a bigotry Pol- thing. Yeah. It's not a Poland. It's not like one of these leaders. It's not like these illiberal um, or right wing, right leaning. It, it, this is this is a problem. Right. So him talking about it so candidly and so directly, ha- I think just even if it doesn't go anywhere, has just normalized and sets a precedent for other more liberal leaders to be able to address Islam as a, as an issue that we need to talk about. It, it just, it just is, it's just so good. I mean, I yeah, think I, just doing that speech on its own has m- made us go years ahead in like just talking about it. Like, I think that co- that one speech by Macron has done s- years worth of activism in normalizing yeah. this discussion. But go and on. I want to add to it. Like, I, I think the way that he did it, was also great. First of all, he didn't pull any punches. He said, quote, so I'll, I'll read out some quotes of, from what he said. He described Islam as, quote, a religion that is in crisis all over the world today, right? Which is absolutely true. I mean, that's something that we've been talking about a lot. We come from parts of the world. We featured people from different parts of the world who have been, you know, evidence of that, like whether it's, we've talked about polls and, and all kinds of data showing exactly what he's saying. Um, he talked about uh, that Islam was in crisis due to, quote, an extreme hardening of positions. Um, he talked about Islamic separatism uh, in France. And he also said Islam in France must be freed from foreign influence. So he doesn't have a problem. He wants that Islam Muslims and French to be French just like anybody else and to be Muslims as well. But he does not like the foreign influence that's coming in uh, that is trying to corrupt it. Moreover, what he said was, quote, secularism is a cement of a united France. Let us not fall into the trap laid by extremists who aim to stigmatize all Muslims. Right? And this, to me, is really important because he is making that distinction that we've talked about here, like probably millions of times, is that uh, criticizing Islam and seeing the problems with Islamic ideology 
I, is not the aim of that. Like when we do that, that's not to stigmatize all Muslims. He's making a distinction between Muslims right, as as people, as a community, versus Islam, right? And the people well, who actually really I mean, take it seriously. To be fair, I would crit I would still criticize him. I mean, this may me being too picky, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't expect him to ever say that. But obviously, he kept on saying radical Islam or political Islam. Yeah. By the way, Ali, I'm getting. I'll reduce my volume a little bit, Ali. Um, mm -hmm. He, uh, he, you know, obviously, if we were talking about it, we, I wouldn't say radical Islam. I wouldn't say political Islam. I would just say Islam, right? Yeah. But again, I that would that's too high of an expectation for me, uh, for of me for a leader like that to be able to come and say like, oh, the problem is Islam. Okay, so that's to me being too picky. So I'm not gonna do that. But yeah, so he did, and to me, it seemed like his main concern. I, Ali, I'm still getting echo. Reduce my. Can you reduce my volume? I can. I mean, even if I mute it, I think the echo is unrelated to that. All right. No. Um, no, I don't think so. But it's okay. Um, I, my, the impression I get is that uh, the issue is like there seems to be two Frances right now, right? Like it seems like to be a growing. Um, again, I've been I've been to France. Uh, I think three times, three times, and my last visit was very I noticed that things are changing compared to the first two, right? Um and I've been to the Muslim areas of France as well. And it just seems like you're entering a different country, right? And I understand that it's only eight to nine percent of the population. Uh, but this is like uh, an eight to nine percent of the population that has comp very different values from the rest of society. And you you don't get that impression uh, of Muslims in, in United States and Canada, right? Uh, the Muslims in United States of, and Canada, again, not all, I'm not generalizing, but more Muslims in the United States and Canada feel like they're American or they're Canadian, uh, and they want to be American. They want to be Canadian, and uh, you know. But uh, there's a higher percentage of uh, Muslims in UK and especially in France that I feel like they just don't see as this is their country. Uh, this is not a country for them. They don't feel French, and they ha they feel like their their country is based on a. It's not their country, but this country that they're in. Uh, even though they're born there and they're raised there, they feel like this is their and foreign land, and they're uh, different. They're different kind of citizens, and they uh, abide by a completely different set of values compared to what is what this country that they're in values, right? And it's basically it's, it seems like a um, separatist movement in, in sense, and that is exactly what he called it, and is what he what Macron is worried about, right? Yeah. And this is not, so it's not just about foreign influence; it's about the 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 level of segregation that exists between Muslims in France and compared to the rest of society. Mm -hmm. Um, and he wants to address that. And one thing that he, for example, one thing he wants to touch on is like homeschooling. Like he thinks, he you know these um. You know, he says, like, these are our citizens. Like, he doesn't want to alienate these people. He doesn't want to push them aside as others. He wants to include them. in. Fr these are not, you know, it's not about immigration. It's also, these are people that are born in France. And what he wants is what he wants them to feel like they're part of this country, that they are... That uh, that they integrate with the rest of society, and these you know these kids that are being born of, of Muslim fa people, he doesn't want them to be raised in this isolated communities in bubbles, completely separate from the values that made France a better country compared to other countries, and he wants to see how he could like save these uh, baby French uh, people, you know, tiny French <laughs> people from from Muslim. I don't want to call them baby. Right, like these are our citizens. People. <laughs> yeah, because I because I don't want to call them baby Muslims, right? Because they're not Muslims. They're just born. Like these are like he's like guys. These are our citizens. You can't just isolate them. You know, you just because they came out of your body, that doesn't mean how you own them, right? This is our citizens, and they need to. You, you know, you can't isolate them from the rest of France, and we need to. So he, what he's trying to do is like limit homeschooling, right? Because yeah. he's noticing that he that they're being raised in tiny bubbles, and they're being they're not being exposed to. The, va the values that the rest of society has. And again, so here's another thing I want to point out to, point to is that if you look at, uh, yeah, so first of all, I just want to finish that thought. He's like, these are French citizens, right? And you cannot, you know, if you don't avoid, you know, exclude them from learning the things that they need to learn. This is a disservice to our to the citizens that we need to protect, right? This is how I see it, right? Um, I think the government has a responsibility to making sure that uh, just because you're a parent, that doesn't mean that you could um, 
exclude certain for important teachings, uh, important information uh, that your that makes your chi a child be able to function better in a society, right? You don't have every right to your child, right? This, the government is responsible for stepping in and making sure that they have the information they need to become um, a healthy part of the so uh, society, right? Uh, a functioning part of a he healthy society. Um, but, um, yeah, go on, Ali. I wanted to, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, so I wanted to actually oh. talk about, put some quotes to what you said um, based oh, on... okay, so before... Yeah. Really quickly, I, I'm going to forget this if I don't say it. Oh, yeah, so I also want to point out that I, I, I consume a lot of... Can you mute yourself because I'm hearing echo? Uh, I hear a lot... I, I consume a lot of, like, far-right content creators and also, for, um, you know, more wokey type content creators. And I always, always notice that they're looking at the same event and they keep uh, interpreting it in completely different ways, right? Uh, and they all exaggerate, right? So one thing I noticed from the far right people is that they keep they they keep thinking like, oh yeah, like Europe has fallen, right? These are Sharia countries now, like this is like Islam is going to take over France and Islam is going to take over the UK. This is going to be like they're going to have you know the Islamic flag flying over the, you know, they just, and it's, so those exaggerations exist. And unfortunately, because they exaggerate that, um, and people see that, and then they go look at actual data and see like, yeah, they're just like, the person, the numbers don't support that. Then they think that any concern that people like me or you have, Ellie, they must be unjustified because they see the far right exaggeration and they think like, oh, you guys are just one of them, right? Uh, but if you actually look at the real numbers, I mean, eight to eight to nine percent, and even lower than that, um, that's a huge. That's huge. Like it, it doesn't have to be as bad as bad as these far right people make it seem like to be. Uh, but even I mean, even five percent, uh, these people are citizens and they can vote, right? And they have. Comp and because they're segregated, like they're not like the Muslims in Canada and U.S., right? The, a lot of them. You know, at least you know they do. They are they are a lot more homophobic. They are very misogynistic. Uh, they are anti secularism. They are, they have views and against free speech, right? And even a five percent, even a five percent difference. These, you know, how do you think elections work? Elections work on sometimes one or two, three, two, one, two, three percent differences, right? And again, if it's eight percent now, and I, I'm, I'm not going to exaggerate like the far right people, and I'm going to say like, oh, it's going to be like one day they're going to have Sharia ruling over France or anything like that. But if it gets to like nine percent, you know, ten percent, these absolutely changes the values of the country if these people, when, when these people can vote, right? Of course, 10% is going to make a huge difference in the direction, the values that France is going to celebrate as a country and push for in a country. Of course, like, I mean, well, even 1% or 2% can make a huge difference. So this is, a th this is a major threat to a country that is the birthplace of Enlightenment values. The birthplace, the country that is the birthplace of Enlightenment value that has made the whole world um, a better place because of the popularization of these ideas has now um, up to 8% of its population um, say, living in isolation and celebrating ideas that is in, in direct opposition to, to the ideas that this country is responsible for. And if that is, if, if that is not a concern, if you think like that is not a concern, I don't know what else to tell you. But go on, Ali. Yeah, so... Um you know, there, there's certain other things that you said. So a couple of things that Armin uh, talked about is about the uh, the kids who are being homeschooled. So currently, there are about 50,000 children in France who are educated at home, okay? And so many of these are, are, are people of minority faiths like Islam and so on. So what um, Macron is going to do is he is going to be requiring them to attend school with their fellow students. Um, he is going to be stressing the importance of schools, instilling secular values in young people. Right, in public schools and and the government would also require private schools to agree to teach them um, so a lot of this has to do with the funding foreign funding of of mosques and the kind of things that are being taught in schools as armin talked about um, the other thing that he acknowledged and this is actually a really big thing for a uh, a liberal generally i mean he's a center left kind of guy 
um, he's, uh, you know, for, for someone like this to acknowledge is this idea of, uh, I, I guess you would call it uh, integration or what they call um, diversity versus assimilation, right? Where he's talking about how it's important uh, for uh, communities to integrate, like especially with these kids, right, that are growing up in France. So, uh, and he accepted responsibility for it. So he said that the French state was partly responsible for the quote, ghettoization of communities. And this exact word, the ghettoization of ethnic communities is something that, I mean, you'll find it in my book, you know, it's something that Armin and I and many of us have been talking about for years and years and years as, as something, this was our main critique of, uh, of the whole multiculturalism thing. I mean, there are many good things about multiculturalism, but this is one of the things that is actually objectively bad. Okay. So it, it causes a lot of problems downstream and, and many immigrants actually agree with this. They, they don't like these sort of ethnic ghettos that, that are formed in these new immigrant communities. So yeah, the ghettoization, so he acknowledged this and he actually acknowledged the French responsibility in saying that, um, that non-secular organizations actually ended up stepping in, like religious organizations set up this, uh, they stepped in uh, to make up for the failings of France's integration policy. So he said, quote, where we stepped away, they stepped in. And this is, to me, at least, Armin, this is music to my ears, because I don't know how many times we've written about this in the last 10, 15 years. I don't know how many times we've talked about it, how this has been a, been a huge issue. So he, to hear, so I mean, you, know, you, you hear like far right people speaking to their echo chambers about this, right? And people resist it. Mm -hmm. But to have somebody like Macron, who, by the way, is like BFFs with Obama, um, who's one of these guys, uh, to come up and, and acknowledge these issues. The fact that, you know, liberal people, their failure to address these issues honestly from a position of, of um, uh, you know, of, of outreach and from a good faith position has allowed, uh, you know, far right communities, ultra religious communities to come in and, and try to hijack this issue and co-opt it and, and uh, uh, step in and do that from a position of xenophobia, bigotry from, you know, extremism, like religious extremism and so on. And then finally, one more thing, Armin. Hmm. He also uh, acknowledged in the same speech that he talked about France's colonial past. So this is a big thing for liberals, right? Because one of the things that drives them to just disproportionately protect minority communities that uh, who, with values that are actually antithetical to what they believe, one of the reasons they protect it is because of this colonial guilt. So he did acknowledge it. So he actually said that you know, colonial past France had uh, including like its colonization of Algeria, um, he said it quote left scars on uh, the society, and he said again quote we have un not we have not unpacked our past. We have grandparents who have passed their scars onto their children, uh, uh, end quote. So what, one of the beautiful things about the speech is not only did he acknowledge head on the problem about Islam and the crisis that it has, you know, all, all over the world, and he was honest about it. But he also talked about all of the different issues and all of the other factors that also go into it, that go into this, including things that he feels that France is partly responsible for. And that's very important because, you know, when you acknowledge you're responsible for something, that's the thing that you can address. That's something you can do something about. Right? So, uh, again, his initiative with what he wants to do with schools and education, his initiative, what he wants to do with cracking down on funding uh, from you know, like foreign funding for mosques and things like that in, in France. All of this is uh, is part of the big story. So it was, I, I think it was a very well thought out, you know, very well intentioned uh, speech that came from a, a place of good faith. Now, the, there are political aspects of this too, but, you know, we'll get into that next. But uh, th that's kind of the way I look at it. So I, I was actually very encouraged with uh, the way that he spoke about it. It really was something that, you know, we'd been wanting to hear from, uh, a good center left leader uh, for a very long time. Uh, one thing that um, I've been saying, and I think Ali has been agreeing, is uh, the best way to uh, fight Islam is to befriend Muslims, right? Um, and the more you demonize Muslims, the more you isolate them, the more you ostracize them, and the more you oppress them, 
you're basically pushing them into creating their own communities and for them to become more and more radicalized and for them to be more isolated, uh, to be exposed from uh, ideas that actually could make them uh, live better lives, uh, for them to go back to um, relying more on Islam and rely more on an Islamic community rather than uh, everyone as a whole. Um, and you know um, accept but befriending them and welcoming them into society will expose them to uh, ideas superior to islam and might have an, even if they don't leave islam they will become less influenced by islam right and i think this whole um you know macron even acknowledging that this is a you know this is a failure uh, which is something that by the way i watch also a lot of islamic channels um and their reviews on this um, they don't highlight the part, these parts, right? They don't highlight Macron saying that we there's mistakes that we've made. Like, nope, they don't highlight that. Uh, they don't highlight the parts that he says that um, we shouldn't be demonizing Muslims or that this is like the radicals are like a minority part of the Muslim community. No, because they want to also demonize Macron for even daring to say anything against Islam. Um, so when they review when they reviewed this news, uh, they were very cl very careful not to mention any parts that makes him that make him um, that might make him look good to their Muslim audience. So that was kind of slimy in my opinion. Um, yeah. So uh, and another thing is that um, you know one thing Ali mentioned with regards to the uh, foreign money coming in, um, and this is an issue that really needs to be addressed, right? Because um, and the thing is. There needs. I don't know what the solution to this is because the political, like a countries like Iran, uh, Germany. No, sorry, I Iran in um, Canada, United States. Iran, Iran's influence in Canada, United States, and, and in Germany uh, or in France or Turkey, especially in Germany. Okay, so the countries like Iran, Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia, and now or even Malaysia. Now, um, what they do is they spend a lot of money. Uh, to try to get political influence in these co other countries, but obvious, uh, but a lot of that would not be legal, right? Um, but the way to do that is to instead of opening political institutions or organizations, uh, you make religious ones, uh, because if you have like a, if for example, Iran um, ma is, has managed to um, create a lot of hubs and you know centers of influence in a lot of Western European and North American countries by creating, you know, schools in Shia Islam or like, um, you know, places that, you know, for celebrating Hussein. And there is no way under the laws to stop that because there's supposed to be uh, absolute uh, relig freedom of religious expression, right? So this is a very easy way for them to be like, well, this is not political. This is just like, you know, so for example, most of the mosques in Germany are, you know, from Turkey. Um, and, you know, Saudi Arabia can keep, um, I mean, Saudi Arabia is like much less than, Turkey is like stepping in where Saudi Arabia failed. But again, you could build mosques, you could build madrasas, and all of these would be completely religious. So these will be used for political um, you know, political reasons, but on the face of it, they're purely religious organizations, right? So, but the thing is that, you know, somebody like Macron is saying, like, you know, we see what you're doing. Like, this cannot, I mean, you can pretend that this is just religion, but you wouldn't be funding all these centers in, <laughs> in Western Europe and North America only for spreading religion. I mean, come on. Um, but I don't exactly know how you can stop that because, again, um, you don't even have to have any political discussion for for you to be able to create a huge base that is loyal to Iran's center for center influence or Turkey's influence just by funding religious organizations. Even though if you don't give them any political agenda, I mean, people's religious allegiances will just automatically a lot of times. Again, not all, but match with their political allegiances. So you don't even have to tell them what political how who they need to be politically allied to. Uh, if you're Shia uh, and you're being funded from Iran to build Shia centers, you know they're ch you know j you just pushing for that, even without any direct messaging from Tehran telling you that you need to be loyal to Vilayat Fari to the mullahs in Tehran. You're just gonna get that. 
you're just going to get that you're going to get that loyalty you're going to get that influence even without any smoking gun that actually could uh, t direct these people to getting any orders from Tehran right same thing with Turkey same thing with other uh, foreign governments so I, I don't exactly know how you could stop that because again they don't have to have any any of these discussions don't have to be political so w what would you do to stop that I don't know Ali do you have any solution to that because I didn't see anything in his speech he said that he just mentioned that this is a concern but he didn't offer any solutions what do you think you're muted I don't know I kind of agree with you on this so I'm kind All of right. saying I agree with everything but uh, yeah yeah um, so we, we go on I, I have other no, things no, to say, I, but I, you can go ahead. No, if, if, if you have something to say, say it. I, I actually want to move on to Erdogan. Uh, yeah. To okay. Yeah. So one last thing before we move to Turkey is one thing we need to be concerned about is not let the uh, right, you know, the far right. Again, I, 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 I'm not, I don't want to use the far right and right interchangeably. They're very, 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 very different. Okay. So please, like, if, it's, if I ever come across, like, I'm using far right and right wing differently, even though I don't. I'm not um, I'm not right wing, but I do not see right leaning people as crazy as far right leaning people. Okay, like there's a lot of sane people on right. Um, just the same way, the same thing I do with the left. I do not like a lot of people on the right, kind of use uh, woke and left leaning interchangeably. But again, that's very different as well. So, but when it comes to um, far right people, let's say, or yeah. I don't know what the best terminology is for this right now, but uh, let's say for far right people, right? They, a lot of them might say, look at Macron right now, and we shouldn't let them do this, okay? They might come out and say that, look, see, we were right, and you guys are only realizing this, right? And we shouldn't let them get that narrative because this is completely different, okay? Um, this is an ideological battle, and I like that Macron is keeping it an ideological battle. It's this is not an anti-Muslim uh, uh, fight that Macron is fighting. This is actually a pro-Muslim. This is, you know, the, this is in the interest of the Muslim community. I mean, in Muslims uh, in France will have better lives if they get integrated with the rest of society, if they're not isolated, uh, if they uh, learn to accept some of the values uh, that is normal in France, right? Um, they will get to be able to participate in the economy a lot easier. Uh, they get to be able to enjoy, uh, the, you know, ha be close to all of France, not just Muslim France, right? Um, this will improve not just their lives, but the lives of their children. Their children will grow uh, with the right skill sets and with the right social skills to be able to function better in, in France, okay? So this is not an anti-Muslim position. Uh, so if the far right people want to come and say, steal this narrative, or like, I, I, you know, I noticed like some Hindus what people saying, like, see, this is, this is why... This is what India is doing right. So uh, France is like way behind Hindus. But like, no, this is completely, this is not at all the same, right? This is not just for the sake of France, but this is also for the sake of uh, Muslim French people, right? Um, and this is um, not, at all, not at all an anti-Muslim position. This is an ideological battle. Uh, and this is not at all what Hindutva is doing. And this is not at all what the anti-Muslim bigots are pushing for. So well, it's, the it's the exact opposite of religious nationalism. Yeah. Yeah, it's the exact it's opposite. Not this, is, this is secularism, not, not, not fighting Islam with something, not fighting one bad idea with another bad idea, right? Um, so if you do notice them saying like, okay, so this shows that we were right, uh, do not let them get away with that narrative. But go on, Ali, you want to move to Turkey? Let me unmute. Okay, yeah. And then, yeah, this, so I want to talk about, so So what happened is that this actually got a very strong response from uh, Turkey. And I think really just, Tur I, I don't think there was, it seems like there was a backlash. There were probably some backlash, there was some backlash from Muslims uh, everywhere, but it really seems like uh, Erdogan was the main guy who really spoke up about this. That's what really made the headlines. Um, and he just went completely hyperbolic on this. And I think there's, and we're going to talk about the reason for it. It's probably more political. Um, they've been at loggerheads, Erdogan and, and Macron, for quite a while now, it's for several months. And we'll get into some of those issues. But um, so this is what he said. He called these comments about that, that Macron made 
about this, you know, Islam being in a crisis all over the world as quote open provocation. Okay, so when uh, Macron was saying, you know, we want to liberate uh, Islam in France from foreign influences, which is actually a really good phrase. Like he's actually talking about liberating Islam. He's like, you know, we want to free Islam from these foreign influences that are corrupting it. I mean, it's a so it's it's. I mean, I don't actually, I don't like that. Of course, already, but again, I'm yeah. not, I'm not going to be picky because this is this is better than what we have ever gotten for for a very long time. But I could be picky about these words like liberate Islam for it to be corrupted. No, Islam is the corrupting agent. But again, I'm not going to be that nitpicky about it. This is good. But that's us. So, you know, when we talk on the podcast and when we're having a debate or whatever, we're going to speak in these terms. But when you're a politician, right, and, and you want to uh, fight this issue, then I mean, this is this is actually the way to go. So um, so Erdogan, you know, when he, he said this, he said that uh, he said, quote, who are you to talk about the structuring of Islam? Um, he called him impertinent. Uh, he said that uh, we expect Macron to pay more attention when talking about issues that he is ignorant about. He said that we want to, we expect him to act as a responsible statesman rather than act like a colonial governor. So there has been a bit of a, a, a thing that Erdogan has had, you know, had you know, in for uh, uh, Macron for a while. And it's due to a few other reasons too. So there's a sort of a territorial uh, issue that they're having over the waters and, you know, uh, between Greece, between Athens and Ankara, like between Turkey and Greece, they've been fighting over the water over there about property because you know uh, Turkey has been drilling there for gas, right, underwater, and uh, you know Greece has been trying to fight back, and France has been supporting Greece, uh, so there has been this dispute over there. So they've been fighting about that since I don't know a year, a little bit more. Um, there's also the recent. Uh, you know, fighting and I mean, it's been going on for a while. The conflict between Azerbaijan and and Armenia. Uh, so uh, you know, Armenia and Azerbaijan have been kind of fighting with each other for a while. Uh, Azerbaijan is a is a uh, majority Shia Muslim country that is allied with Turkey. You know, it's officially secular, uh, and uh, Turkey has been supporting Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has a small community of Armenians uh, in that uh, what's that disputed area called, Armin? But, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But by the way, this whole thing is the uh, is between Azerbaijan and Armenistan is is from my perspective one aspect of it is very bizarre. Uh, is because for the first time, the, in my life, I think yeah, in my life, yes, because before my life, this this um, Iran and Israel are on the same side. <laughs> of this, Iran and Israel are on the same side of the con of the con of. This is the first conflict since, since my birth that Israel and Iran understand under supporting so, the same Israel side. They're supporting just supporting the same same side of the conflict. But go on. So they're supporting Azerbaijan and Turkey. Yep, Turkey, Iran, and Israel are on the same side of this conflict. Why is Israel on the uh, Azerbaijan side? Well, Israel has been trying to. Well, it goes back to Iran. It always goes back to Iran. So the suspect, the suspicion is that, um, you know, other than it, I think the main groups after the Kurds in Iran that are separatists are the Turks, right? Uh -huh. So these are the Azeris, right? And we have like so Azerbaijan is a country, but there's also a province in Iran called Azerbaijan, which was like a very strategic mm -hmm. mistake for you to name that. Azerbaijan, that province of Azerbaijan, after the country that is neighboring to it, um, right? So that just really encourages a lot more separatist movements. Um, but I think Israel is very interested in encouraging separatist movements in Iran, and a lot of Azer Azeris in Iran see themselves as part of Azerbaijan as a country rather than Iran, and they are pushing for separating from Iran. So the reason I think, again, you correct me if I'm wrong. I think the reason why Israel is supporting Azerbaijan is the exact opposite reason why Iran is supporting Azerbaijan, right? <laughs> because Iran, historically, Iran is, is on Armenistan side, right? So this is this was bizarre for a lot of people, a, a lot of analysts, even in Iran, were like, what the hell's going on? Why is Iran switching sides? I think Iran is becoming weaker in controlling its separatist movements. And I think they're trying to appease people now instead of, like, forcing them to stop, Right. 
So it's Iran is like supporting Azerbaijan makes a lot of Azeris in Iran support like me be a little bit more less aggressive against Iran's government. Right. Because mm. they see like, oh, wow, the Iran's government is on the right side of this. Right. So I think like Iran is like kind of Iran's government is kind of scared into making the Azeris even more angry than they are right now. So I think that's the ca political calculus and not to encourage more separate. So basically Israel is supporting Azerbaijan to maybe use the separatists in Iran to, to push back against Iran. And Iran is supporting Azerbaijan to calm them down <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> to like tell them to be like, look, look guys, we're on the right side. Please like don't, don't so, attack. Uh, I, I, so, Azerbaijan is actually overwhelmingly uh, Shia, right? Shia majority. I think so. Yeah, let me. But are they that. are they ethnosphere Shia or? Um, yeah, I think so. Hold on, I'm not sure. Interesting. Actually. Okay, so um, yeah, because I actually don't know that much uh, about it about the demographics. Um, um, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, look that up. But yeah, three fifth. Yeah, three fifth is Shia, one third is Sunni. But one again, that's Shia. not. Yeah, so th that would make a lot of people might think that, and that would make them a natural ally to Iran. But um, blood is thicker than water, and sometimes ethnicity is becomes more of an issue than religion. Yeah, it seems in 2012, uh, Israel was actually granted access to air bases in Azerbaijan um, to potentially yeah. use against Iran's nuclear program. It's added. Okay, so there you yeah. go. This is this is that region. Okay, so we, we yeah. don't know. This is another whole whole the whole issue over this. So there's should a we, there's a. Should we do an episode on that or no? Like yeah. Well, we, I, let I, us I, know. I, let us know if you want us to do an episode on that. But go yeah, for me personally, this is absolutely fascinating. But it's also new to me. It's something that I didn't really focus on a whole lot before. So I don't know how many people would generally be interested in it. But I I would be happy to do it. I, I, I'm we, totally down we, with it. Alex, we're so, gonna address that question um, soon. But go on, Ellie. Yeah, so I mean, basically, that there's that separatist region in in Azerbaijan called Nagorno Karabakh, right? Say, so, and this is the place where there's a small group of Armenians, and they have been wanting to secede, and they've been wanting to, um, and, and and that really is the the focus of the conflict. And uh, the re most recently, uh, what happened was France has accused uh, Erdogan of uh, funneling uh, jihadists from Syria through Turkey. Uh, into Azerbaijan to fight against Armenia. And, you know, France is on the side of Armenia, and you know, Turkey is on the side of Azerbaijan. So, so th there's been that thing going on between them. There's been but the territorial waters. Um, secretly, secretly, without officially saying it, both Iran, Iran's government, and Turkey see Azerba current Azerbaijan today as part of their future borders, empires. Yeah. Right. So, both Iranian nationalists and the Iranian government, who don't see to eye to eye, right now they see eye to eye in this. Like they say, one day Azer current Azerbaijan is going to be part of Iran, and Turkey also. Turkey as well. Like, no, these are these are Turks. These are our people. We're gonna, <laughs> oh, dude. There's Turks that think they're gonna one day liberate Tabriz from Iran, and T Tabriz is gonna be part of Turkey one day. That's what they think. Yeah. Fascinating. So it's, yeah, it's crazy. But go on. Yeah, so I mean that's basically it. So there's a background, there's a political background. These guys have been like trading barbs for a little while uh, with each other. So this was a great opportunity for you know Erdogan to try and see if he can unite the Muslim world against uh, you know Emmanuel Macron and, and paint him as some sort of like serious Islamophobe. But it doesn't seem to really be catching ground. And I think that that's kind of what I want to talk about next with you, Armin, is that. So, you know, we had the Charlie Hebdo attacks in 2015. That was obviously brutal. Uh, then, you know, the trial happened, and there was this guy, the Pakistani guy, I went out and stabbed two people. And, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of things have changed. I mean, the focus isn't really that much on it. I mean, people have become very desensitized, and they've kind of normalized uh, a lot of the blasphemy against Islam because it's become so ubiquitous around the world, right? And especially on the internet, and you know, with all these ex-Muslim communities, and uh, you know, people, and the, the rise of the far right. I mean, the criticizing Islam and, and everything has become very, very um, mainstream compared to what it was yeah. like just literally five to fifteen unlike, years ago. 
Unlike criticizing Hinduism, apparently. Yeah, like, that's the next nut we like, gotta crack. I don't, I don't lose my accounts for criticizing Islam anymore. I lose my accounts for <laughs> for criticizing Hinduism. Yeah. So this is a, we need to move forward. We need to move against that, normalize that. That's Eastward. Next, yes, yes. Eastward and um, back in time. But but a lot of Muslims are frustrated by this, by the way, and this is where Turkey sits in because Turkey thinks like the Muslim like is trying to show that it's the representative. It, it, yeah, it's the new defender of Islam and Muslims mm. across, not not in Turkey, but globally. Yeah. Right? So, um, and again, this is exactly, by the way, mutu- uh, can, I'm hearing a little bit of echo, it's okay. Yeah. Um, but so, t- Turkey wants to step in where Saudi Arabia was supposed to be. Like, I mean, Saudi Arabia had such an easy case, right? Like, we're the guardians of the um, two holy cities. Medina and Mecca, uh, where are the country, the birthplace of Muhammad? I mean, I mean, if we're not the leaders of Islam, this Sunni world, who else? So it was supposed to be the Saudi Arabia being, ever since 1979 Islamic Revolution, it was supposed to be Saudi Arabia, the leading country, the leader of the Sunni world, and Iran being the leader of the Shia world. And... Iran did a very good job at, I know, again, not all, I know Shias are going to be like, yeah, I mean, no, the Vilayat Faqih in Iran doesn't represent us. Yeah, 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 yeah. But overall, the Iranian government did a very, very good job at making it uh, seem like they're, the, I mean, effectively, politically, they are, um, to a large extent, um, the, the leaders in, in the geopolitics in the Shia world. Again, not everybody, but largely so. And Saudi Arabia failed. Saudi Arabia failed. Saudi Arabia tried to export its ideology beyond this border, just like Iran did, and built madrasas all across the world. And what they did backfired, and a lot of all those people that they created, uh, radicals that they created, now they want to behead the Saudis, right? Um, So they created a Frankenstein monster that is now turning on themselves, right? And they have zero control, zero uh, the, the the dog that they bred, they don't have the leash. They, you know, it just ran over. You know, but the people, the Shias that the Shia um, proxies that Iran built across the world, they're very loyal to Tehran, unlike the ones that Saudi Arabia built. Right, and again, the whole Islamic world, they do not, uh, they do not. The, the Shias in Canada, they look for to Iran for funding. They look to Iran for support. Right, but the Sunnis around the world, they do not look to Saudi Arabia. They condemn Saudi Arabia. All right. Um, I mean, Saudi Arabia wanted to have its cake and eat it too. It wanted to be like, oh, we're the leader of Muslims around the world, and we also want to be close to the United States. And for a long time, that was their thing. And people were like, what the hell? How could you be close to the United States and feel like you're representing the Islamic world? And now they're like, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to be close to Israel as well. So basically, that, was, that seemed to be like the end of the pretending of representing the Islamic world when you become buddies, buddies with Israel, right? Um, and then, so when it comes to like issues like China, China like putting more than one million Muslims in concentration camps, uh, a country like Saudi Arabia not only did not go out to say like yeah we condemn this, they sent a congratulation letter to China for doing such a great job at at fighting against radicalism. Saudi Arabia, that's supposed to be like the representative of Muslims around the world, congra- officially congratulated China for doing something. You know, not just commenting, like officially, letter congratulating China for the great job they're doing in fighting back against radicalism, right? So, you know, Muslims like, yeah, no. Um, I mean, for a long time they were like this, but now it seems like it seems like Saudi Arabia is not even trying anymore, right? Uh, and that's why Turkey is doing it, having Turkey was like, we want to be like Iran, but for Sunnis. Uh, and I think Turkey is a bit frustrated that Iran manages to, you know, have such a tight control over Shia influence around the world. But for some reason, Iran is doing going beyond Shias and is also doing a great job at controlling Sunni, uh, you know, having an influence on Sunnis around the world because of the Israel-Palestinian situation. Because all these Arab leaders are not defending Palestine against Israel. In fact, they're becoming closer to Israel. And the Muslims are noticing that it's Iran that is defending um pretending to defend pretending to defend palestinians against israel right um so a lot of sunnis uh, were like becoming allied with iran as well uh and looking for iran's political and financial support rather than these arab countries and turkey's like guys if you're if you if you don't want these arab leaders at least 
look to Sunni leaders. Like you don't have to, you know, you don't. Yeah, you don't need Arab leaders, but we are like Turkey is at least Sunni. Like Palestine is Sunni, and Turkey is Sunni. Um, we are going to be the def- champions. Like they want to. So basically, Turkey wants to recreate the Ottoman influence that they had, right? Uh, and become the, you know, how they were the, you know, for the Ottoman Empire was basically the caliphate of the the main authority over all the Islamic world, not just Turkish people, but all of Islam, right? And they kind of want, they have this vision, they have, by the way, they, they're open about this, and this is not something that you have to read in between the lines, right? They want to bring back the Ottoman Empire. So Iran wants to back, bring back the, uh, not just the... Persian Empire. Yeah, not yeah, but not just the Safavid Empire that was Shia, but also like go back to the Sasan, like this, yeah, the pre-Islamic Sasanid Empire, right? Which, is, but the Turks they think, like Turkey thinks, like this is like this should be easier for us to do because uh, Iran has like this dualism that it has to deal with in the country because the empire, uh, the ambitions to in, in, in among Iranian to bring back the empire is pre-Islamic, right? So Iran was as, as it was very powerful when it was the pre-Islamic area, right? Some people are trying to sell the Safavid Empire, which was a Shia empire, uh, to be like, maybe we could use that as to create ambitions of empire among Iranians. But that not that many people in Iran have this romanticized view of the Safavid dynasty, right? They have this romanticized view of the Sassanid and the Hachamanishi dynasties, right? So that is not at all Islamic, so Iran has this conflict between, okay, if we want to motivate people to feel like we, it's good for us to go beyond our borders, do we use this nationalistic argument that is pre-Islamic? Um, but, so they have, they have two different narratives that they have to work with. They, with the Shias, they were like, oh, we're basically making people, we're, we're, doing, we're inviting people to Islam. That's why we need to go beyond our borders. Um, and these are like uh, uh, Shia religious shrines are outside of Iran's borders in, in their Iraq. And basically they have this religious narrative that we need to defend those. But then they're, they're most of the country that is not very religious, they, they have to use a pre they they have to tap into their pre-Islamic uh, empire romanticized view of Iran's empire narratives to to try to convince them. So they have to dan- dan- you know dance this uh, you know play this game with their own population and deal with mo- contradicting narratives. Turkey Turkey says like why is Iran doing this so effectively? We don't need to do this. So, do, do, we don't need to play this contradictory narratives because uh, the Ottoman Empire with the, the time that Turks were at in power it was when they were Muslim, so it was both an it was both a Turkish empire and a Muslim empire. So we could like play into people's nationalist um, desires and show of strength with their religious show of strength at the same time without seeming like we're you know competing against our own narratives, right? And we can be like we can show to the Muslim worlds that we are on the right side on all these things. We are anti-Israel. We are pro-Palestinian. Um, again, th- that anti-Israeli narrative doesn't work as effectively as in Iran because they still have relationship with Israel, right? But they, they pretend to at least be anti-Israel. We are pro-Israel. Uh, we are pro-Palestine. And we also have taken a strong stance against um, China, right? Um, so, but... So they're sa- and also we're we're Sunni, goddammit. They're saying, God, you like most of the Muslim world is Sunni, and we're Sunni. So where where Saudi Arabia failed, Turkey wants to come in and say, like, look, we are it. We are your guardians, or Muslims, okay? And they want to increase their influence, not just to Turkish Turkish influence, but all Muslim influence. And this whole coming out and speaking against um, Macron is part of that entire thing, right? It's part of that entire narrative yeah. to come and say, like, look, whenever Islam is being attacked, Turkey steps in. But go ahead. Yeah, no, so I, I think that the, the way that this is actually going to happen, what Macron has announced, is putting this into practice uh, is going to be uh, the strengthening, well, they're going to add to the 1905 law. So France has, so they, their, their version of secularism, they call it laïcité. It's this term that actually has a very strict separation of uh, church and state in France. It's a little uh, different from the one in the U.S. because the U.S. still allows for, uh, they, they have religious freedom is a big deal um, there, but 
in France, for instance, you know, there was even um, a lot of debate. I mean, they didn't want any uh, uh, sort of religious symbols. So the hijab, the Sikh turban, Christian crosses, stars of David, the kippahs, uh, you know, the, uh, the yarmulkes and everything that the Jews wear, all of these, they wanted it banned from public schools. And that did happen in, in 2004. So uh, they have a, a more strict, I mean, they're, they're very, very strict about this. And this is not something that is um, done specifically to target Islam as it sometimes, you know, you see the laws in Quebec here in Canada um, where it was actually motivated by the Islam thing, but that, that, that isn't really how it's been historically in France. In fact, they've probably been more accommodating uh, to Islam than to the other religions. And, and now I think Macron is just making the case that no, you know, this is just like all the other religions. I mean, they should be treated uh, exactly the same and we have to enforce our secularism. So they're going to be adding to the 1905 law. Uh, Macron is sort of give the timeline he's given is in December. There's going to be a modification to it where they're going to add these initiatives of uh, public schools, well, not just public, but private schools as well. And, you know, bringing a secular education and cracking down on this foreign funding for of, of mosques and, and things like that. So um, I think it's really interesting. It'll be a good example to see how this turns out. I think it's the right way to do it. Um, you know, as far as the religious symbols and everything. Excuse me, I had to cough. But, but let's make sure that we go, don't go above one hour. So um, yeah, let's do that. So let's. I, we'll just go into. There's a couple of uh, questions and comments here. So let's just go let's into just that. Let's do these two. Um, I have one more comment to make, but I don't know if I'm going to have time. So this is the two of the Patreon. By the way, guys, if you're watching this, uh, the audio version of this. Um, that means that you're not a, you might, I mean, you might be, but if you're not a patron and you want to join these live discussions and get your questions in and watch this live with us, the video version of it live with us, uh, check out the link, uh, in the description, uh, you could become a patron and then we'll tell you guys when we go live so you could join us live. But Alex is a patron and that's why he's uh, here and he's the comment. Go on, Ali. He has a comment and, uh, Alex of Oz is saying neither religion nor anything else should be allowed so much freedom that it subverts secularism or enlightenment tenets right i don't know and, if i agree with that because i think he's responding to the uh, the freedom of religious expression I, I think i don't know i think maybe alex is saying that I, maybe i'm wrong maybe he's saying like if it's too so free that other countries are able to bring in political influence um then that that is a freedom that should be limited i don't know I do think that if you give the government authority to limit people's expression of ideas, uh, you're creating a bigger problem than the one you're solving. But go on, Ellie. Sorry, say that again, Norman. What did you say? I said that if you think the government the authority to limit people's expression of ideas, you're going to create a bigger problem than the one that you're solving. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's. Uh, the, uh, I, I think what he's talking about here about uh, be allowed so much freedom. I actually agree with this comment completely. And I'm going to quote somebody who I don't agree with a whole lot all the time, and that's AOC. You know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? I can see you're not going to roll your eyes already. Okay? But here goes. This is something that she said. I mean, she said this t today in the... Uh, no, I'm rolling your... I'm not rolling my eyes because of her. I'm rolling my eyes because of you asking if I know who she is. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So she said, quote, The only time religious freedom is invoked is in the name of bigotry and discrimination, and I'm tired of it. And she said that in, in response to this new Supreme Court justice. Okay, but bigotry oh. and bigotry should also be free. That's a problem. But this is what what he's talking about is that usually when they talk about religious freedom, right? You know, the, recently the Supreme Court of the U.S. is saying that they may reverse the gay marriage okay. thing, the same-sex marriage thing. They're doing it in the name of religious freedom. Okay, I think that's but, what he's talking about. But bigotry should be allowed if it's coming from private people like that's the the one the example uh, yeah. that you mentioned yeah no but, yeah, but I, I don't think comes, this is... no but alex is saying neither religion nor anything else should be allowed so much freedom that it subverts secularism i mean if you if your secularism and values is being subverted because people are defeating you in spreading your ideas the solution is not to silent silence no, I, I, I think he's talking about official secularism like you know yeah, when it's established let me, let me finish this but i think the yeah, solution see? should he just updated it. Okay, okay. Maybe I'm misunderstanding it. I will highlight the update, but let me just finish one sentence. Mm -hmm. um, the solution to that should be the sh solution to the bad idea spreading is for us to do double done and 
spreading secularism and enlightenment values. So yeah. Alex is clarifying. Alex is saying, I'm not talking about expression of ideas, but practice. Exactly. Again, yeah. what, no, again, practice, even practice, if it doesn't violate any, like if it's not harming any, if it's not a direct violation of rules that are there to avoid harm, like if it's a practice, like what kind of practice? It depends on the practice. Like if people praying as a practice, that should be allowed. Again, expression of religious views should completely be free. Um, again, so it really depends on what we, we have one minute. Yeah. We have one minute left, so okay, I yeah, want to yeah, get into Mars's Mars. question. Yeah, and and again, uh, Alex is saying he's not talking about silencing. I think he's okay, talking okay. about officially. Okay, so okay, let's okay. look at Mars's question because it's really good. Saying if Biden gets elected with respect to the current times, ideally, could he now take a similar stance to Macron? Didn't Obama try it once but had to back off because of the blowback? Um, I think that what happened uh, when Macron got elected is in the U.S. you got Trump. Over there we got Macron. Macron ended up here. Macron is a very similar guy to Obama and Biden. Okay, and he ended up here and he ended up making this stance. This would not this did not happen with the whole Trump thing. Um, I think it'll take some time in the U.S. The whole Islam thing is actually a lot more sensitive because of the four years of Trump. So it might take a little bit longer. But I know that they have the same position. They all have the same position. Obama's talked about it. He's talked to journalists like Jeffrey Goldberg about it before, too. So um, they have the same position. It's just a matter of how they bring it out to the public. I hope that they do. Mm. Um, yeah. And also, Alex, thank you for the clarification. Sorry if I misunderstood. I use your comment as an excuse to address something else, even if you meant something else. Um, um, but thank you for clarifying your views. Um, oh, yeah. But again, I need to respond to this. Sorry. Alex, you say not praying, but e.g. misogyny again i don't think like misogyny if it's not coming from government if it's from misogyny can, should not be banned right it should be fought against again maybe i'm misunderstanding you and maybe we just disagree which is okay i don't think like we should like if people say like are you free to be like should people be free to be misogynist yeah of course they should um, we should there are other ways that we could fight it again i'm not saying even if you mean something else i'm just just using it yeah. as a way to. So I, I'll to, take. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'm going to take Alex's side on this. I think uh, okay. the way that I'm interpreting it, Alex, is I think you're talking about uh, religious freedom. You know, becoming uh, overwhelming uh, the the secularism tenets as they are officially in the government. You know, when that happens mm -hmm. and you have a choice between, okay, we've got religious freedom. Should we allow people to discriminate against gays because they're Christians? Oh, okay. and Versus secularism, yeah. where you know you're, we shouldn't do that. Religion should be secondary. Then, uh, then it should be the latter. I mean, that, that's yeah, the way yeah. that I'm interpreting what you're saying. But and I, also I sometimes, sometimes some people when they say not allowed, they don't mean like government should stop it. Sometimes when people say something should not be allowed, that means that we should we should not sit idly by and let it just grow. Like we do need to do activism against it. Right. So That's it really right. also, so also sometimes what it means by not allowed. Okay. But again, Alex, um, I, I didn't mean, I, I know I might be misrepresenting you. I, pro I probably am, but uh, I use it as an excuse to say a few other things as well, but I really appreciate your uh, comment, especially because of, uh, above earlier, you said, bravo, Armin. I don't know what that was in reference to, but I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, and the guys, the people in the live chat, thank you so much for your patronage. You guys are, you know, helping us keep the lights on and making sure that we have these shows coming. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. If you're not a patron and if you're not struggling financially, please uh, link in the description. Consider becoming a patron. But if you are struggling financially, do not become a patron. Do yeah. not, do not, do not even consider it. But go on. We have upcoming episode coming up on sex and religion, so that's going to be actually really interesting. So we actually yeah. haven't talked about that. We never yeah. actually discussed that. I had a whole episode on, on like sexual repression and religion. So I think that's going to be really interesting. All right, everybody. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, Alex, you're confirming you do mean government. Um, so, yeah, thank you. And I completely agree with you. Um, again, free us. Susanna saying yeah. free the secular jihadist Twitter. They have suspended these accounts. And I don't know why anybody would have a problem with us, Arvin. I, why does anybody ever have a problem with us? We're just we we're not hurting. Him. We're just expressing our just, ideas, like guys. Great people. All we're trying to do is like, be Alex best. Is like, we just yeah. want to be best. We, Hashtag. We, <laughs> you just want to. What are you gonna do? Ali, what are you gonna do when the Trump administration is? I over? don't know. I am <laughs> dreading it. I've been watching these videos of Trump and him. You know, he's becoming even more and more unhinged now. It's yeah. so entertaining. I don't know what I'm gonna do. Oh, so you're gonna. I'm miss actually it. gonna, miss, gonna it. miss it. I'm gonna miss All it. Right. All right, guys, be best. Bye. Be best. The secular jihadists have been made possible thanks to the Illuminati and the covert support of Israel and the CIA. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. 
If you like what we do, please support us. Share the podcast with your friends. Write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions. Or head over to secularjihadist.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you. Thank <laughs> you.